right. I'll share my screen one more time so you can see my sponsors. All right. Well, welcome and good. Good morning on behalf of Washington's Association of Wheat Growers Ammo Program. I'd like to welcome you. I'm Katie Gilkey, and I'm WAG Outreach Coordinator, and I'll be today's moderator. This is our second educational event of our 2024 Ammo Series of workshops. And in order to just um, have you, I'm going to make you know right now that I'm not going to be good at multitasking. I'm just posting right now in the chat. If you want to see the other um, programs that are coming up, there's the link that will send you right to um, all the information you need to get um, RSVP and register for the renewed. A few housekeeping items before we begin. At the end of the seminar, I will put a link in the in the chat uh, for a survey for you to participate in. And I'm going to thank you in advance for your feedback. Um, we really take you seriously, and I guess the price of admittance is we ask you to fill that out for us. And a big thank you to our sponsors that you're seeing on the on our slide here on the screen makes these programs possible for our grower members and industry partners. And if you recognize or work with any of these entities, we thank them for being here. That goes a long way for me next time when I ask them again that they know that their customers and people that they work with feel it's important that they participate. So please help me in that. Uh, please keep your line muted or I will. <laughs> um, and when it comes to time at the end, we're going to do questions with our speaker, who I'll introduce here in a second. Um, and for the for today's webinar, I'm just going to ask you to text me, and I'll put once Sean gets going, I'll put my phone number. Um, I just have you text me your questions, so that way if we get kind of same questions, we can augment them all together. Um, if you feel like you want to um, ask something right away, maybe raise your hand, and we'll call on you. But if you just got questions as we go along, just text those to me, and um, I will we'll do it at the end. So without further ado, I would, I'm gonna stop my sharing so you can see the screen. And I wanna introduce Sean Hackett, who is our speaker today, who is a frequent contributor to Barron's, Futures Magazine, Reuters, Bloomberg, US Farm Report. He'll be sharing more of his background shortly, but I just wanna let share that he's an ag commodities expert. Um, Sean has dedicated his life to educating the ag industry leaders, farmers about financial risk management hedging, and the uses of indicator-based ag commodity price forecasting tools. So with that, Sean, the, the screen and presentation floor is yours, so to speak. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Just to let everyone know, we are price forecasting specialists using statistics, cycles, and correlations to information in the past, whether it's currencies, whether it's interest rates, whether it's climate, to provide long probabilistic outlooks of what risk points there are and where marketing opportunities might be for those involved in producing wheat, grains, and those in the livestock sector. And before I get started, the NFA always requires that I make a remind everyone that not everything I say today will turn out to be true. There's always risk for loss in any futures and options program. Understand what you're doing and act accordingly. What I wanted to do today given what I believe is an unusual situation. I don't normally start off this way, but I uh, I feel given that we're dealing with uh, a lot of wheat growers on this call or those that, those that will uh, watch the show, I want to kind of lay out what I think could be a one in 50 year winter kill event sometime in mid late February here. And I want to go over why we think this is possible. And obviously there could be a tremendous opportunity you know, for those in the wheat sector to lock in a much better price than we've seen lately. And let's so let's let's just kind of dive into this short term outlook. I want everyone to understand clearly what's been going on. Right now, we are involved in what's called a sudden stratospheric warming event. This upper right chart showing this very, very warm stratospheric air pushing the cold air to the right. It's called a sudden stratospheric warming event. We had one of these, by the way, in mid-December. And that led into the polar vortex first three weeks of January, which was in many areas, 100 year cold. And in many areas, some of the strongest snows we've seen since the 1970s. Typically, if you're gonna get one of these, it's a 30 day delay from the time you get a sudden strike when it starts. This is right now, 
it started in mid-January. When we're looking at what this polar vortex is going to look like by mid-February, notice how it's changed dramatically. The warming is now pushed to the outside, and look how we have this distorted, cold polar vortex that's pushing into the U.S. This is called a polar vortex um, intrusion. And sometimes an actual piece will come off. This was what happened a few weeks back, and it will just send crazy, crazy cold. 30 days from the beginning of this sunstroke warming event would be mid-February. All our indicators, and there's a lot of other indicators that we won't go on in this call because it's a little higher order and I don't want to lose everybody, but just suffice it to say, um, we think there's a very high probability of a second round of polar vortex cold air. The problem is right now for the next 10 days, we're dealing with 100 degree warm temperatures. And a lot of winter wheat's going to be coming out of dormancy, unheard of typically to be coming out of dormancy. Um, you know, HRW, SRW, especially in the central south portions regions. And so you have winter wheat coming out of dormancy, trying to put growth on, and then you get this cold air if it were to come ahead of snowfall, which we think there's a good chance that happens. You could have a situation that really just is off the charts, unusual and could cause a stir in the marketplace. And I really wanted everyone to understand this setup because it's so unusual. Two weeks ago, I wouldn't have been talking about this because you know there's no way I would have been able to have predicted a hundred year warming, but here we are. I just put these slides on last night because it's this that important for wheat growers. And more importantly, you know, it could really set up an amazing and, and a very positive uh, cash marketing opportunity with what's been going on with wheat for the last couple of years. This might be a finally a, a bright spot for producers to get some, you know, bring some more money home on the farm. This is what we're dealing with now. Unbelievable heat. And by the way, Europe is, and, and Russia, Ukraine, and Europe is experiencing similar 50 to 100 year warming temperatures. So there is a possibility that we could see this polar vortex also come into uh, overseas, maybe about a week or week and a half, 10 days delayed. Uh, but the U.S. is really the focus here because obviously this is the who we're talking to and we're wheat growers in Northern Hemisphere, I mean, uh, North America. But this is what's preceding. If it wasn't that the wheat crop was coming out of dormancy, it, it still could be a, an important event due to lack of snowfall and all the melt. But coming out of dormancy and potentially having this kind of a whipsaw, it really could create, uh, just like I said, a, a one in 50 year or even more type of event. And so this is something to pay attention to as we get closer to mid-February. The way it works is the weather models tend to only see this coming at the last minute. And all of a sudden you get a, a, a very significant response in advance of this cold air. Buy the rumor, sell the news is not unusual with these types of weather events. So you need to be on guard to, you know, taking action as we start getting, if we start getting this reaction ahead of this crazy event that might be coming up. This, uh, there's a one particular model that we have found over the many, many decades that we follow sudden strike warming events that tends to pick up cold from polar vortex SSW events well in advance. And that's the Euro control. It's a subset of the Euro ensemble models. This is what it has around the 15th of February. And you can see that we're talking about temperatures anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees you know, colder than normal, especially in this HRW area, even colder and potentially in some of this SRW area. The key is, does this come in before snowfall? Does it come in after snowfall? It's very, very difficult. Slight changes in timing can alter when snow or cold comes. But to me, the key, either way, I think there's going to be some kind of a reaction to, to sell into. But um, the key will be getting how the market anticipates that happening. But this is what we're looking at, something that could stir the pot a little bit. Remember, sh uh, speculative short positions in the wheat complex, especially winter wheat, are at some of the highest levels as a percentage of open interest ever. So we have the potential for a large reversion or a large short covering of all these speculators if they get caught with a one in 50 year type of event. It's it's just a, it's a it's an explosive setup that I just want to 
convey to those that produce could offer, you know, a good cash cash marketing opportunity. The other thing uh, that I wanted to mention that I normally don't talk about now, but but just to make sure that some people may not be able to be on this call for the next hour or so, um, uh, we have a, a set of conditions. We're going to talk about this a little bit in the, later in the presentation, but we have a crashing. El Nino to a La Nina. This is what's going on in 24. La Nina is breaking down and we're going to be moving back towards La Nina. We have a very warm Atlantic Ocean. We've had a warm Atlantic Ocean for the better part of the last 20 years. We're at the four year peak of the 11 year solar cycle. And I don't wanna to get too up far afield, but there's something that the earth wobbles five degrees around its axis every 18 years. And when it reaches its maximum degrees off center, it tends to produce greater distortions of upper airflow patterns um, globally as well as in the US. And when you get this rare combination, um, it tends to lead to a hard potential freeze in the first half of May. So this would be your secondary risk factor. We were not anticipating the one we just talked about, but it just developed. This is one we've been talking about for the better part of the last six months. Our work's been telling us that we could have a, what's called a fall spring. You get a very, very warm April. Everyone gets rock and rolling with corn and soybean planters. Their wheat crop is coming out. It's putting yield on, it's growing. And then you get, you know, you get a whipsaw. And so this is a, a secondary risk point, you know, that could create another stir, not only for winter wheat, by the way, but also could cause a stir for early planted corn and soybeans that get out of the out of the gates fast here in April. Uh, something to pay attention to once again. Also in wheat, also in corn, speculator shorts as a percentage of open interest, record setting. So we, we have a situation where, you know, the speculators are all on the bearish side of the boat. And our experience is something eventually comes along to get them feeling they're on the wrong side and they need to get back the other way. And at least, at least it could cause potentially a short-term cash marketing opportunity. Right now, everyone's very, very negative on grains. Everyone's feeling very, you know, bad that nothing good can happen. But, but these are a couple of risk points that might create a change in the narrative from what we've been seeing here lately, which is simply prices eroding away. So, the summer growing season. This is um, really, uh, you know for all grains, but I kind of wanted to go over how we look at things and what drives our long-term cycles and statistics and correlations. Weather on earth is driven by outer space. The sun, the moon, the sun's activity, drive sea surface temperatures, drive upper airflow patterns and drive our weather on earth. So if we understand where we are in these cycles, we can have a pretty good idea of where we might be thinking of or looking at in a particular growing cycle. So 2024, we, I'm gonna mention this again, this is this 18.6 earth nutation cycle where we vary five degrees every 18.6 years. 2024 is peak off center, meaning that's where we're maximum five degrees off center. And that means that the sun's gravimetric influences and solar influences and the moon's gravimetric influences act in a certain way. We highlighted all the years that 1952, 1970, 1988, 2006 are all years that we had this maximum wobble off of center and um, 2024 is next. So that's one of the cycles and we're gonna go over what that means in just a second. The other situation, and that's this, this is the 11 year solar cycle. We measure the activity of the sun by sunspots. The amount, these big explosions on the surface of the sun that push heat out from the sun, create solar wind that eventually hits our atmosphere and drives climate on our planet. It goes up and down where we have very few sunspots. We have more sunspots, very few. 11 year solar cycle. This has been going on for as long as the sun and the earth have been in existence. What I wanted everyone to appreciate is that one full cycle is called the Hale cycle. That means two of these peaks. One of these peaks occurs with what's called North 
northern hemisphere polarity. That means that the northern hemisphere drives the sunspot activity. And then it swishes to what's called southern hemisphere polarity or the southern hemisphere is driving the polarity or driving the sunspot activity. You get very different outcomes with weather depending on whether it's a northern hemisphere or a southern hemisphere. We're in the northern hemisphere polarity driven sunspot cycle. And that's what I've driven here that these peaks represent that. These are the years, 1958, 1980, 2000. And it's the fourth year from the trough, which is your initial peak in the solar cycle. So 24 is exactly that point again. So this is another cycle that we're gonna be talking about in just a second. The next thing we've already alluded to before, but we, we've been in a strong El Nino really since the fourth quarter, we're peaking and everything says that we're going to be crashing, collapsing this El Nino into a La Nina by the end of the year. This is not something that's never happened or happens periodically. Here are the years that we've seen that happen. 2016, 2010, 1998, 88, 83, 73, 70, 64, 1995, 2024, according to our work, is going to be another one of those crashing situations. These are the three cycles that are going to be driving the summer weather pattern here in the U.S. The two big factors that go into, well, I'm going to preface by saying before we go into it a little further, this is a hot, dry cycle meaning this is a drought cycle. These three uh, cycles lined up like this are a hot, dry cycle overall. How hot, how dry, and the distribution has two factors are the key that we need to be watching for. When does La Nina arrive? Does it arrive by July, meaning July or sooner? Or does it arrive after July? If it arrives before July, we'll have a more broad, hot, dry drought pattern. If it occurs after July, it'll be a little more concentrated. The other factor is that um, we're noticing cooling in the Gulf of Alaska. The Gulf of Alaska is this right chart here. We put the circles called the Gulf of Alaska. It's been cooling. You see the blue colors here? We're seeing a cooling down. This has been cooling dramatically over the last 30 days. By the way, every single Earth mutation cycle has created or has, has had a cold Gulf of Alaska. What I always say with cycles to everybody, just because it's happened before, every time in the past, does it mean it must repeat? These are cycles we're looking at prob probabilistic wise, what's going to happen. But so far we are seeing it. If this hap if we continue to see this cooling into the summer, that would increase hot, dry risks on a broader area. So if you're thinking this through to maximize, and I'm not trying to maximize, I'm saying if you were to look at the maximum drought potential for this particular year, it would be the La Nina comes by July or sooner, along with a cold Gulf of Alaska. These other factors are already in place. The 18 year mutation cycle is set. The four year solar cycle is set. The collapsing El Nino has already begun. I mean, it's it's a these are kind of so we're just trying to determine timing. Either way, it means that we're not likely going to have the kind of crop year that's going to produce trend line yields. I don't think we've produced trend line yields for the last four or five years. I don't think we've been able to do it. Even if we have a late arriving La Nina and we don't have a cold Gulf of Alaska, I still feel this weather phenomena pattern is not gonna, is still not going to allow for trend line yields, but it won't be a disaster. So let's go over things a little bit more in detail. This is the sea surface temperatures of the center, central Pacific. This is how we determine El Nino. If these waters are above 0.5 degrees, you're in El Nino. This is the blue line is actually, you know, is, is actually where we are. And we are, you know, we're sitting right here at the peak and what we did, just so everybody knows what this chart is, we took the very best analog fits to the current trajectory of El Nino sea surface temperatures that averaged at least an 88% correlation. And we ran them out and said, what happens What happens now? And we are seeing that we're, gonna, we're looking at a crashing situation into, you know, into, this, into the summer and into the fall. 
Um, and so that's this, this X is our growing season in 24. This is your best case scenario that we just talked about, meaning that if La Nina is later and we don't have cold Gulf of Alaska, this is a central north, central northwest Canadian prairie drought. Actually, it's very similar to what we saw, I think it was three years ago, where we had those horrific uh, spring wheat, uh, hot, dry conditions. This is your, this would be the best case scenario if not everything happens to maximize the drought. So this is kind of what we consider to be our high probability forecast, meaning we're going to go with this until, you know, in two months from now, three months from now, we're going to be able to get a much better handle on when the La Nina is going to arrive or on, on how this Gulf of Alaska, and we can change this model to broaden out further if we need to, but we're really comfortable that this is at minimum is what we're going to expect. So obviously those in growing, you know, winter wheat, uh, uh, spring wheat, canola, obviously corn and soybeans in this region, you know, this is the, this is the high probability problem situation. Now we look, you know, farming is a long-term business. So we look out for the following year. And if you follow this analog pattern out, we're going to be in a full-blown La Nina for 2025 growing season. That gives us this high probabilistic for 2025. So this is a much more worrisome drought pattern than this one, if because it's a more, it's more broad. This is like this is a this is your your not if everything goes right for the drought forecast. We always try to be conservative with what we're saying, suggesting. We can always add drought on, but we don't want to want to make sure we're giving everyone the minimum that we're expecting. So what is this? What is this telling me? We're not likely to have trend line yield crops for grains. Now we can argue it's, it'll be like the last three or four years where we grow good crops, but not great. But it's possible that if we get the right alignment of everything, where we get a much more profound drought, like 2012, 1988, 1983, 1955, you know, that you get something more sinister. That is in the running for the next for these next couple of years. We are in the running for something worse than that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want that. I'm not, I'm not rooting for that. I'm just saying that some years you just don't have the cycles in place. We have it for this year and next. This is the heat. What we learned last year, and, and, and I think it's a great reminder, we had the driest May and June in the central grain brown in 50 years last year, but it was cool where it counted. Then we had timely rains. It was still cool where it counted. And then we had timely rains in the first half of August for soybeans, and it was still cool where it counted. Then the hot dry weather came for the rest of the crop season too late. Hot and dry. If you're going to knock these genetics down, if you're going to knock this precision farming down, if you're going to, if you're going to really nail these crops the way we grow them today, it has to be hot and dry at the right time. We view the right time, June 23rd, August 15th. This is a chart of the average temperatures for all the variables we just discussed, this is your temperature distribution for that key period from June 23rd to August 15th. This is telling me we're not going to get away with a cool summer where it counts like last year. We're going to have plenty of heat. There's other factors that we'll talk about later that I'll mention a little bit now, but we have this Tonga eruption that occurred a few years ago that is accentuating warm hot weather extremes um, everywhere in the world since it went off. We'll go over that in a little bit, but it, it could mean that this uh, warm could be a lot warmer than this because of the Tonga effect. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So the heat to me is going to be there. And if we have, you know, something like this, or we get a broadening, if some of this, uh, if the La Nina comes early or the Alaska sea surface temperatures are cold, you know, then we, then we have the ingredients at the right time for something more sinister. So, so that's the short-term view of frost risks, our growing season, next year's growing season. I, I wanted to get that out 
in case not everybody can listen to this entire one, although I do know it's going to be recorded. Um, and now I want to get into some other variables. We're going to get back to climate in a little bit, but I wanted to get this out there because this is obviously incredibly important looking at where prices are today and everyone's deciding planting decisions, crop insurance, reference prices for crop insurance here in, in, in February, so forth and so on. But I wanted to give everyone just kind of a, 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 uh, a quick run on that. But weather is not the only thing. We also follow currency cycles. And, in, and this is a this top chart is what's called a 95% confidence interval chart, where we look back at the behavior of the US dollar going back to 1970 to the present. And if you should, you should kind of notice that what, it, what this is suggesting is that every time we get to the lower 95% confidence interval, we surge back up and then we surge back down and then we surge back up and then we surge back down and then we surge back up and it follows a fairly reliable 16 year cycle i have no idea by the way why that exists i'm just telling you it exists and so we follow cycles and it and so look what we did here late last year this is this is december of 2013 this point right here we went to the upper level of this 95 percent confidence interval and now we're breaking harder to the downside it it's confirming thus far this cycle is still at work. If the 16-year cycle follows suit, then we would expect the next major low in the U.S. dollar to be around 2026, give or take a year. And we would expect it to come to the lower end of the confidence interval range. Why is this so important? If the, weak, if the dollar value is weakening, it creates inflation for U.S. priced commodities, for U.S. priced agriculture. It makes our prices elevated relative to farm prices. What we've been seeing for the last couple of years is a rising dollar. We keep losing ground relative to the price of, of other countries. And, as, and you know, farmers are now starting, are starting to suffer low prices and, and now, you know, and, and, and sticky input costs. If you look at the 19, um, if the, this 1970s wild agricultural commodity inflation, not just because of the dollar, but the dollar was a huge contributor. If you look at the period in the 2000s, wild commodity inflation. If you look, if you looked at the pattern in the in the 19 after the crisis in farming, from mid 80s onward, we had a very very significant rise as the dollar started doing its benefit. The bottom chart is the Brazilian real. We now know that they have become in most, most every ag market that we follow, the big exporter, whether it's coffee, whether it's cotton, whether it's corn, whether it's soybeans, sugar, you go down the list, they are the dominant big or becoming the dominant big dog. So as the rate, the real is extremely important to how US ag commodities are priced. If the dollar is going down at some point, the real would strengthen in value and, and meaning the dollar would weaken against it. I, what I wanna show in this chart is that we have a consolidation, a four year, five year consolidation real going sideways that looks to be completing here sometime this year. We're gonna be looking for this to break out to the upside. The last time this happened was in 2002 and we had it almost an eight, year run higher in the Brazilian real before it topped out. Enormously uh, inflationary to US ag commodities relative to the commodities that are priced in Brazil. So when I look at these two charts, I'm pretty excited that we're going to get currency led commodity inflation in our markets going forward over the next two to three years. Um, and we need to be on the lookout for signs that that trend is accelerating. Remember, if the dollar gets weak, we become much more competitive in the export market. We get to sell a lot more stuff. One of the big problems in the last year is we haven't been able to sell as much corn, as much soybeans, as much wheat as we would like to. And it's made our balance sheets a little um, a little bloated, at, according to the USDA and others. So keep an eye on the currency, but our work right now says this should start to be our friend as 2024 carries on. Geopolitics, man, this is, um, 
Boy, I, I mean, we've been talking about geopolitics now really since the trade war between the U.S. and uh, and China when when President Trump instilled that trade war and the tariff war. And uh, it's just been escalating ever since. So there's another cycle, a 53.5 year war geopolitical cycle that reaches crescendos every, every 53.5 years. This has been going on, by the way, since the early 1800s, this cycle has verified. Does it have to verify again? No, but certainly we are in some kind of an escalation in geopolitics. I mean, now it's it's the Middle East and it's Israel, and now it may, maybe Taiwan and China's next, or something we don't know is coming. But geopolitics is going to continue to be a bigger and bigger factor in our markets than they've been in a while. And the bottom chart here is overall commodity prices. And I, what I wanted to convey, these crescendos in the war cycle, you know, we, we, we saw significant price inflation for commodities going into and through these peaks in the geopolitical war cycle. Repeatedly, this has happened. The next cycle peak is 2026. By the way, when's the dollar supposed to reach its trough? 2026. I don't make this stuff up. These are two independent cycles. They don't know each other, but just just, just an interesting uh, serendipity, shall we say. So 2026, so whatever's going on, it's gonna, it should continue to escalate into some kind of a big bang crescendo event, whatever that is. I'm not looking forward to it. I wish it doesn't happen. I hope it doesn't happen. I hope this cycle finally fails. So far, it does not look like that's the case. It looks like we're, uh, these this geopolitical cycles are alive and well. But more importantly, what it means to commodities and especially agricultural commodities, it's highly inflationary. Tr trade gets disrupted, hoarding, stockpiling becomes more in vogue because everyone's worried they're not going to be able to buy when they need to. Um, a lot of money is spent on wars. A lot of money is printed to fight wars. Highly inflationary. Maybe that's the contributors to why the dollar is going to really fall. It's because we, the U.S., becomes the biggest spender in some kind of a global war. These are just speculations on my part, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is this is a very historically important variable that looks to be on the side of, in, of increasing inflationary risks in agricultural commodities. Lastly, before we get back to climate, our favorite topic, um, interest rates follow a 35-year cycle, 30 to 35-year cycle. They go. This has been going on since the 18, early 1800s. They could fall for 30 years. They go up for 30 years. They fall for 30 years. They go up for 30 years. This is a chart that says we just broke the 30-year 30 30 year trend. And now we're in for a overall period of higher interest rates. Now, it doesn't mean we go back to 15 to 20% or what happened in early days. It doesn't mean that. It just means that the, the free money that we had for the, for the period from 2010 to 2020, that period of free money is gone. And we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at an increasing cost of capital. Now, an increasing cost of capital means it's harder for producers to be profitable because a lot of the debt that they borrow that they have to borrow to fund their operations and to grow production is going to carry a higher interest rate, a higher cost of capital. I mean, you need now higher prices in order to justify the higher cost of capital. The last time we had this cycle turn up was in the mid 1960s. And we know that was a highly inflationary period for agricultural and commodities in general. And, and what, ha what it means is that it's harder to expand production when your when your cost of capital is getting ever more expensive, when you have free money, almost every project you propose kind of works out because it's you're dealing with money that has very little cost attached to it. So this is another cycle that historically, now by the way, this period from 1900, wildly inflate. In fact, it was one of the most inflationary periods for commodities ever. Was this period rising interest rates, 70s rising interest rates. It's a it's a it's another factor. So when you think this through, currency cycles say more inflation ahead. Geopolitical cycles say more inflation ahead. Interest rate cycles say more inflation ahead. We already touched a little bit upon climate, and we we want to touch about 
this other variable, which is weather volatility. All our research that we have done as far back as we're able to look at ice core samples and Turing analysis and anything we can get our hands on shows that weather volatility expansion is a part of every single agricultural commodity inflationary cycle bar none. So we now want to talk about what's going on with that. Uh, I'm not going to go over every slide, but I do have these slides here that if you want to, if you want to get a copy of this slide, I'm sure Katie can send it to you. Um, but I want to go over the more importance, but certainly weather volatility is another huge factor that should fan the flames to agricultural commodity inflation. So the first thing is, this is an inflation adjusted chart of insurance payouts. And I guess the whole point, there's no perfect way to measure this, but I think this is a pretty good way. It's just noticed a big increase in payouts on major extreme weather events here in the US alone from 2002. This is going back to you know 1980. This is a global chart going back to 1900. Inflation adjusted, something has gone on to where this weather volatility is causing insurance companies to pay more and more money out. Inflation adjusted, meaning I know everything's more expensive, but we're trying to normalize apples to apples. Something's going on here. Is this just short term in nature? Is this just a blip? Is, is, is there something else going on here? Why is this happening? How long is it going to continue? And what do we need to do about it? I think we talked about it before, but I really want to reiterate our weather on Earth comes from space. The sun's gravimetric forces, the moon's gravimetric forces, the sun's activity. And remember, all our planets have different size, different magnetic field strength, different gravimetric strength, spin around their axis at different rates, revolve around the sun at different rates, and are always moving, which means their influences are always changing climate on Earth and altering the sun's and earth's forces on our atmospheric airflow patterns and on our sea surface temperatures. I know I said a heck of a whole lot there and you probably your head is spinning, but the whole concept is that climate is always going to be changing. There's no such thing as steady climate. And if we understand how these cycles work together, we can have a pretty good idea on what the long-term picture is for weather volatility. We talked about this in our initial forecast for the summer. And I want to reiterate, this is the 11-year solar cycle. The sun has very few sunspots. We go back to peak sunspots, low sunspots. It's an 11-year cycle, trough to trough, peak to peak. Look what happened here. The peak came in half of normal. The peak that we're now at, half of normal. We have two 11 year solar cycle peaks that are half of normal. This now means we're in what's called a grand solar cycle minimum. That means an extended period of 30 to 40 years where the sun's activity is subdued. This chart on the right where you see WM, SM, MM, this is DM means Dalton minimum, Maunder minimum, Sporer minimum, Williams minimum. These are your grand solar cycle minimums that have occurred in the past. They happen approximately every 220 years like clockwork. We are now in one again. And when that happens, our upper airflow patterns change and our weather volatility changes very, very dramatically. What I, how, how, the best way to describe this is this, the, this blue line is a 22 year moving average of sunspot activity. If it's going up, that means the sun is getting more active. If it's falling, it's getting less active. Notice that the last grand solar cycle minimum was down here in the early 1800s. And look at where we are now. We've been falling ever since about 2020 and we're in free fall with this solar activity. When did the volatility and payouts start to really get going? Right around 2000, give or take, is when we really started to see the weather kicking up just as the solar cycle was starting to quiet down. <clears throat> there are other forces, like we talk about the planet's movements that can alter. Um, Dr. Yoshimura and Dr. Gleisberg are two famous physicists that did endless work on this. This, uh, These red and green bars are, are certain planetary alignments. When they're up above the blue line, that means they're enhancing 
the sun's activity, when they're below it, it means they're taking it away. Notice that in the mid 2030s, both the Yoshimura and the Gleisberg cycle uh, are going to be re further reducing the sun's activity and reducing the solar wind, meaning we're going to get an accentuated solar cycle reduction versus the last grand solar cycle. So why do we care? How does this, how do we get weather volatility out of what I just said? This is an actual measurement. All these slides, by the way, have, have the data source, have are cited to the author. You can go check it yourself. It's public information. There's nothing on here that's proprietary or hidden. But this is the upper atmosphere. That's the upper stratosphere. This is the temperature differential that over the last 15 to 20 years. Notice how much colder the air has gotten since the sun's output hitting the atmosphere has gone down. This is the middle atmosphere. Notice how these temperatures are also cooling. This is where we live, still getting warmer, still in the warming phase. We haven't noticed any change yet. There's a 22 year lag between reduction in sunspot activity and when we start to see changes in our temperature pattern. If we follow the typical cycles going back a thousand years, we expect this cooling to hit our atmosphere post 2025. This is NASA. NASA looked at the last two grand solar cycles and measured the temperature differential from normal temperatures to the trough in temperatures at the peak of the grand solar cycle minimum. And you can see how much colder the, the last two. And we went and studied all the ones that they didn't look at, and they all had a significant cooling trend as, as a result of this atmospheric cooling on the way down. But why the weather volatility? This is a measure, I love scientists. Some, somebody gets up and they measure the thickness of the atmosphere. This is the thickness of the atmosphere. Somebody gets excited about this and I'm so excited that they get excited because I can share this information with you. This is telling you that since 2002 or three, we've seen a dramatic contraction of our atmosphere. 4,400 feet on average is when the atmosphere is contracted 4,400 feet because of cooling atmosphere, sinking air, cooling our, I mean, this is real time data, not hyperbole, not my theory, it's actually happening. So what does that mean? If you have a shrinking atmosphere, this is probably the number one slide on the entire slides that I have. That is the reason why we've been getting increasing weather volatility and why we believe it's going to be here, why it's gonna be escalating for at least the next decade before it starts to go the other way. We prior to 2000 and to this grand solar cycle minimum, this is the world we lived in. Zonal flow, jet stream, east, west to east, storms come in, storms come out. We have a little bit of weather volatility, but for the most part, we can grow crops all day long. This is now what we have undulating north to south, wavy jet stream wild undulations. This creates extraordinary weather volatility, massive storm creation out of nowhere. Um, the derecho storm from a years back that decimated the Iowa crop was a function of how the atmosphere, when you have vertical, uh, hot and cold next to each other, you can create these crazy upper airflow expansions. Record warm mid-December in temperature, record cold first three weeks of January, record hot first two weeks of February, and if we're correct about our forecast, record cold back half of February into March, you can't make this stuff up. It's just, um, and, and that's a function of this jet stream being crazy wild. And it also causes stagnant weather patterns. When the patterns get set, you're stuck. Last year's 900 inches of snow out west in California, breaking records of all time because they were on this part of this undulating jet stream and it just sat there the whole time and didn't move. One atmospheric river after another, after another, after another, endless. And of course, every single reservoir that was never ever going to be filled ever again got filled to the top in one season. Unbelievable one year turnaround because of this kind of dramatic weather pattern. This is the weather pattern that we're in. What is this telling me? Price volatility is here to stay. 
whenever and so that is a that's good news because that means producers are going to get opportunities when people get excited to bring more money home on the farm and selling these big spikes higher that we get when weather gets array when we get those crashes off of those weather phenomenon and we see those prices come down because demand gets hurt or we get a few good crops the buyer the livestock producer he's going to get a chance to do something smart. Every time that we have more price volatility, farmers are more profitable if they're proactive with their cash marketing and their risk management, whether it's through crop insurance, whether it's through you know doing some hedging operations, whatever it is, this offers lots and lots of opportunity. When corn back in 2015 had record low, 50 year low in price volatility, five cents was a big move in 15 in corn. It's really hard to do anything smart to bring more money home on the farm other than just operating as excellent as you can. Volcanoes. We talked, we alluded to this at the beginning. When you have grand solar cycle minimums, they tend to reduce the magnetic field strength of the earth, which destabilizes the tectonic forces of our earth. So historically, big volcanic eruptions always occur during these 30 to 40 year periods when the sun goes quiet. Um, we measure them in, in something called VEI or volcanic explosivity index, like the Richter scale. We're looking for a VEI six or higher to have dramatic increases in global weather volatility. Typically we have three of these during a, a complete grand solar cycle. And this was the first one to fire off January 15th, 2022 Tonga volcanic eruption was a VEI six. It actually was the only the second volcano to ever reach the mesosphere. It's unbelievable how high this column got. What made it even more unusual and made this a one in 1000 year event, it was an underwater volcano. Meaning instead of pumping sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere, which is what a normal above ground volcano does, it pumped water vapor instead into the stratosphere. Once those aerosols get into the stratosphere, they stick around for, for four to five years before they precipitate out. In the case of water vapor, it is a heating agent in the atmosphere, meaning that this creates heating risks during the summer growing cycle in both the Northern and Southern hemisphere. The smartest scientists in the world, once this went off, predicted that we would see hot weather extremes, the likes never seen in a hundred years based upon the Tonga eruption doing what it did. Sulfur dioxide does exactly the opposite. Sulfur dioxide is a cooling agent in the stratosphere. Mount Tambora was the last one of those to go off in 1815. If you do a search in your computer um, for the year of that was summer, we had frost in July in Iowa during that time, which was the grand solar cycle minimum last when we had a, that VEI seven volcanic eruption go up. This one, however, hot weather risks, and it's going to continue to produce those risks for another two years before they precipitate off. This is actual uh, water vapor in the stratosphere, real time. This is when the volcanic eruption went off. We doubled the amount of water vapor in the stratosphere, literally in six hours. Unbelievable. And with, and this is a current chart. These, so, and this is not precipitated out yet, meaning uh, this is different parts of the stratosphere. We still have this, this, this Tonga effect of increasing extreme hot weather risks at work. And that's why we mentioned at the beginning of our, of our presentation that where you see where it could be hot, probably it could be a lot hotter than that, given that we have this Tonga effect still working with us for probably another couple of years. Be on the lookout for more big stratosphere, I mean, big um, volcanic eruptions. We There should be two more that occur. Um, if you see someone on TV, say a VEI-6 or VEI-7 just went off somewhere in Indonesia, you have to know that weather is gonna go cycle for the next year or two, and you have to be understanding what that means and be prepared for a dramatic increase in, in price weather, volatility, and challenging global conditions. Oceans. Oceans matter a lot. So what's really interesting 
about this cycle that we've already talked about with the sun and the moon and this 18.6 year wobble of five degrees from the axis of the earth. Um, if you log in all these different interactions, there's a 60 year cycle where the, the, the PDO is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. This is the sea surface temperature of the Pacific. If it's blue, it's cold. If it's warm, it's, if it's red, it's warm. The AMO, which is this one here, is the Atlantic Ocean sea surface temperatures, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. Red is warm, blue is cold. Every 60 years, both oceans will go into colder than normal sea surface temperatures. The last time this happened was the midnight, early mid 1960s to the early 1980s. And we had weather volatility off the charts during that period of time. If anyone recalls and farm during that time, we had crazy, crazy weather volatility. We had a wild ag inflationary cycle because of this weather volatility cycle. The sun was firing normal, by the way, it was just a sea surface temperature cycle. That cycle is due to come post 2025, meaning that if this 60 year cycle repeats, we would expect the Atlantic to get into the cold phase post 2025. Um, by the way, we, this period in the early 1900s, we already talked about one of the greatest inflationary periods for agriculture in history was another time when we had this both oceans going into the cold phase. Has not happened yet. Has not happened yet. We're still warm Atlantic, cold Pacific, but I'm warning or, or letting everybody know what we anticipate if this long-term cycle repeats, we would expect to see that happen. One of the triggers that I want to highlight here if, you, if you've never been to the Oceanographic Woods Hole Institute website, I highly encourage you to go there, put it on your favorites, watch their information. That they're, they're, they're absolute pros at oceans and everything, anything to do with oceans. They came out with a scientific publication two months ago called The Imminent Reversal of the beaufort geyer Currents. The beaufort geyer is right here. It's on the northwest side of the Greenland. Normally, these currents are going clockwise. All this melted cold water from the glaciers gets locked up here and it stays here and it stays here and it won't go anywhere. But then there's a then it, what happens at some point, the volume of cold and the change in the and the atmospheric conditions reverse the Beaufort Geyer to go counterclockwise. When it does that, it dumps all this cold fresh water into the Atlantic. And it's one of the mechanisms for why we get the Atlantic Ocean to go move into the cold cycle every 60 years. This chart here is the is called the global so a, it's called the salinity event, the great salinity event. Meaning when all this fresh water comes into the Atlantic Ocean, it reduces the salinity. You can see how that happened went right in that early mid 1960s and caused that significant change in the Atlantic Ocean and that significant pickup in weather volatility. We want to be on the lookout for that they believe it's imminent when you read their paper if you read their paper if you wish to read their paper which i did they think it's it's a couple of years away from releasing the other way the second you see that happening and you hear that happening and you see you notice that these cold temperature uh sea are are happening you have to immediately know that this is that sean's 60 year cycle is kicking in and we need to be on guard for it this is a really good chart it's kind of a summary there's a long-term sea surface temperature cycle, which is this green line. There's a uh, shorter term, 60 year, pretty much temperature cycle here. And then this is the solar activity. Notice that we've been in a generally warming ocean from 1900 until about now. And we're just starting, just about ready to roll over here around 2025. This is the shorter cycle. Remember we talked about how the oceans got cold in the 70s and now we're now they're really warm. And it's just about ready to turn over, meaning that the Atlantic is just about ready to join the long-term cycle and the solar cycles already turned 22 year delay. Everything says post 2025, all these cycles would be in synchronicity for the first time in 400 years, astonishing that all these cycles, so what that means that we're in for a very, very significant change in our overall climate patterns, temperature patterns, weather volatility patterns from all these cycles being 
moving into synchronicity. And if you look at when they're all in synchronicity, they're all in synchronicity into the early 2050s. So that is something to, uh, it's a great chart to just kind of put it all into perspective. This is a great chart, 92% correlation coefficient between temperatures and Atlantic sea surface temperatures. When the Atlantic is hot, like it's been, we're hot. When the Atlantic Ocean is cold, we're cold. The, and the Pacific Ocean determines El Nino La Nina frequency. When we add the sun's activity to this equation, 94.2% per, coefficient, co uh, correlation coefficient between temperatures on earth sun's activity along with Atlantic sea surface temperatures. Remarkable data set going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Our moisture patterns are also altered by oceans, the long-term changes in our oceans. We have been in sea, warm Atlantic, cold Pacific. It means all kinds of drought out West. And we know for the better part of the last 20 years that the West has been just dealing with drought on an ongoing basis. They have like a little bit of a respite and then they go right back into drought. This has been the predominant pattern that we've been in. When we finally convert over, this is your new moisture pattern. Cold Atlantic, cold Pacific. Notice this blob of unpleasantries. We are still going to have to deal with some issues of drought in the middle of the country. But overall, it's a more... It's a wetter pattern for the U.S. The big issue that comes with this because of the colder overall change in the temperature patterns, we have longer winters, shorter duration growing cycles. So in the 70s to now, we've increased our, our duration of growing days by 35 days. I, don't, I haven't done the work to know how much yield has grown because we have 35 more days to grow it, but I do know it's a lot. And I do know that a lot of ground up north that could never grow corn, for example, grows corn now when we're counting on those group those areas to grow corn now they never could grow it in the 1970s they just didn't have a, they didn't have a, a right weather for it so so this is the eventual shift but the next two years we're still here and that 24 25 means we're still here and we're still have hot dry risks and you know for the for the for the u.s but especially the western portion of the country Dr. Gleisberg, is, I mentioned his name before, and I'll mention his name again. He was a magnificent physicist that studied the sun his entire life. He came up with the idea that after eight 11-year solar cycles, or approximately 89 years, uh, we complete a full solar cycle. All the planets and all the different combinations of interaction start from zero again and we start anew. He found that at that point, we have historically developed a one in 100 year drought potential in the Midwest every 89 years. So these, this, these blue lines is the Palmer Drought Severity Index. And this is where the Gleisberg cycle triggered. And you can see that this was marginally the worst drought of that 100 years. This by far was the worst in the 100s. Of course, the Dust Bowl was the granddaddy of them all. We weren't satisfied with this though. If we we're gonna present this to you and have you take it seriously, we wanted to have more confidence that this cycle repeated more than just three centuries. So fortunately, we're able to look at tree ring analysis and ice core samples, just incredible data we have now that we are able to look back and reconstitute Palmer Drought Severity Indexes going back a thousand years. And we were able to log this cycle and verify that it occurs every 89 years, roughly plus or minus one year. It's, it's verified for 11 centuries. If it's going to repeat, it doesn't have to repeat. I don't know for sure it's going to repeat, but it, if it's repeated for 11 centuries and it's naturally occurring, we're going to go with it until proven otherwise. 2023, 2024, 2025 is your three-year window for this to happen if it's going to repeat like it has for the last 11 centuries. We know 23 didn't happen. 24, 25 still on the docket. As I shared with you in the beginning part of, of the presentation, we have some concerning 
cycles and metrics and variables that are saying that that the dry weather is on the dock for the next two years. If it all comes together, the Gleisberg cycle would say it is all going to come together one of these two years. What's interesting, if you look back to 1895, all our major droughts, this Dust Bowl, 50, the early, the mid 50s drought, the 88 drought, the 2012 drought, they all occurred when we were in neutral to mainly La Nina sea surface temperature regime. If you were in El Nino, it's not going to happen. What saved us last year is the El Nino came just in the nick of time to take the punch bowl away. As we said, we're moving away from El Nino back to La Nina, this crop cycle. And if we get the La Nina to come early enough, which we don't know yet, then, then, th then we would be increasing our risks to the potentially this happening. So we need so so that's the why it's so important about the timing of La Nina this coming growing cycle. If it's later than July, highly unlikely you're going to have a Gleisberg cycle drought. If it comes in late spring, it's we are upping the ante significantly. So that's what we're going to be watching as the months go by to see how are we tracking the El Nino La Nina uh, changeover. I want to talk, I want to finish off. I know I'm a little bit long in time, but I want to finish off here a little bit on Brazil. Uh, obviously, they're becoming very, very important. And I want to I want to highlight that not all El Ninos and La Ninas are the same. Uh, this is a chart of all the different kind of sea surface temperature regimes you can have in the Central Pacific. You can have a normal El Nino. You can have what's called an El Nino Modicai, where you have concentration in the center, cooler to the east. We've had this. We now have this, meaning that we've now had migration to the center. This is what we're looking like, warm in the center, cooler to the east. This is our own El Nino Modicai index, which means if these temperatures are 0.5 degrees warmer than they are here, it's El Nino Modicai. The Walker cycle completely changes. It pushes moisture away from central north, central west Brazil versus pushing rain to it. It's very different than this walker cycle where it's pushing rain all the way in. The last time this happened was 2015-16 growing cycle. If you recall, second crop corn, which is their main crop, produces 80% of their corn production, was down 22% that year. We looked at every single El Nino Motokai going back 50 years this is your moisture pattern for March, April, and May when they're going to be pollinating second crop corn. Mm -hmm. This suggests that we're not looking at a very good outlook for their corn production potential. Remember also that we're dealing with record low subsoil moisture in Mato Grosso this year because of the drought that we've had for the first part of the growing season, the worst drought in 100 years in north, central northwest. I want to talk soybeans a little bit. There's a lot of debate about soybeans. I just want to talk about this a little because they're harvesting it now. They're harvesting soybeans. I think they're about 12 or 50% harvested. This is moisture pattern from October 1 to present. And if you look at this, the dashed line is our current moisture to date. The yellow line is what we did in 2015-16. Look how we had record heat. versus 2015-16. Um, this suggests, this is for uh, the, the northern part of Brazil. This suggests that we would expect to see similar behavior or worse behavior utilized than we had in 15-16. What's even more interesting is this is a vegetative health index. It's a, it's a satellite, takes a picture and has an algorithm that tells you how does a crop look based upon the crop you're looking at, based upon history. This top line is what it was in 15-16. This bottom line is what it was this year right now, much worse conditions than we had in 1516. Everyone is expecting big, big record crops in the South. And I think it's gonna come up short already. Harvest results in Piranha have come up short, uh, are coming up short from expectations. A good crop, but not as good. This is telling me that the 156 million metric tons, we are um, 
hearing from Conab and the USDA are still too high. Our best guess is that we're going to wind up being somewhere between 140 to 145 million metric tons. We were supposed to produce 160, 165. At some point, the market will begin to put a pencil and paper together with that. And what it means, it means that it, we think that the exports, U.S. exports of corn and soybeans will improve later on this year versus our 2023 experience because Brazil is simply not going to be able to export in the manner with which they did last year. And, and I'm going to end off the conversation with something about Brazil that I think is very, very important food for thought. I'm going to run it through quickly. I don't want to spend too much more time, a little over my time. This is moisture levels in central west Brazil, driven by the uh, Amazon monsoon. Look how the, just rainforest, 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 slam. We have dropped moisture pre precipitation by 50% in the last 13 years. Yeah, there's been a small volatility, but it's, and, and this, is a, a, this would be a record low precipitation year. Our work and the work of people way, way smarter than us are suggesting that we're losing our atmospheric river mechanism, whereas the Amazon flows into this atmospheric river, causing this, this kind of rainforest mechanism that, that has kept Brazil the garden spot to grow crops forever. 20% of the crop, 20% of the Amazon is now gone due to deforestation, due to Brazilian plantings of other crops. And another 20% is in rapid reduction. It sure seems plausible. Can't say 100% for sure yet, but it definitely looks plausible that one, I can think of no other explanation. We've never seen anything like this drop off in moisture in 100 years. Something's going on here. They might have killed the golden goose by expanding their acres and expanding their acres and expanding their acres. If that is true, we might be looking at a much different Brazil in terms of their capacity to grow production going forward than they have in the past 10 years. This is interesting. This is the Amazon River reached an all-time record low this growing season because of record low Amazon monsoon rainfall. This is a, a 20 five-year cycle, a normal cycle where the Amazon gets more active, rainfall-wise, gets less active. We, the 2020 was peak natural Amazon rainfall, meaning we're already seeing these kinds of droughts at the peak of the cycle, and we're now we're moving into a much lower precipitation pattern. I'm very concerned that if we're showing this kind of rainfall at the peak of the normal Amazon cycle, what's going to happen 10 years from now? It could be a renaissance for U.S. producers that might be able to gain market share back after losing market share for the better part of 20 years. I'm not wishing anything bad on Brazilian farmers. I, I've been down there multiple, numerous times. They're wonderful people. I'm just saying something to pay attention to. They have not been growing yields. They've just been growing acres. Very important. Corn and soybeans yields have not been growing in recent years. U.S. yields have not been growing in recent years. Flat, actually, wheat yields have been down for, for, the, for quite a few years. Ever since this weather volatility got crazy, we've been having a tough time grow, growing our yields. Is it a pause? Is it a long-term trend? All our work says that this is a longer-term trend. Does it mean we can't find a new way to do it? Does it mean artificial intelligence, quantum computing, drones, there's other new technologies that if the price is right in terms of profitability, we can find ways to, to figure out a better mousetrap. But it seems like we've hit a wall with the weather we've seen and our ability to overcome it. This is the last, this is a quick summary before I will open it for questions. We're in a grand solar cycle minimum according to our work. Weather volatility should accelerate for the next 10 to 15 years. Look for the Atlantic Ocean to move into the cold phase after 25, adding additional weather volatility. El Nino Motokai is in place, very different than normal El Nino, meaning very, very dry weather is likely to be in place in January, in March, April, and May. Mato Grosso, second crop corn. Historically, we've averaged 15 to 25% below year over year declines when we've had this kind of a El Nino. Something to watch as a reason to maybe get ourselves back on the docket for being 
the go-to person for exports. The Gleisberg cycle, one in uh, every eight or nine years, we tend to get the right upper airflow pattern, 89 year cycle, eight 11 year solar cycles is, is due for 24 and 25. 25 right now is our preferred year if it's going to happen because it's 100% La Nina, which we said you need to have. This year we're, is still the jury's still out because we're not quite sure how quickly La Nina is going to arrive. We need more time to figure that out. But nonetheless, the next two years are drought cycle years and could be something far more sinister if the right conditions come to play. Um, be on the lookout for a polar vortex to come back mid, late February after po a crazy post dormancy here in February. Winter wheat, HRW, SRW, if it comes before snowfall, could provide a cash selling opportunity. Late May, uh, first half of May, additional hard freeze risks to not only winter wheat, but corn and soybeans. And that's it. Hopefully I didn't go too long, but uh, this is where we are. I appreciate giving me the time. I want everyone to understand that I view preparation as the mother of skill. I live in Hurricane Alley down here in Florida, Southeast Florida. I'd rather know that there's risks ahead so I can prepare and alter my business and alter the risks so I can be a more profitable operator through it than, than to get run over by it. And to me, that's the power of proactive preparation. With that, I will hand it back over to Katie. Thank you, Sean. Now, if anyone has any questions, I think just as as people are putting their questions in, one question I have is, is at the end of the like, wow, that's a lot of information. So I'll, um, I'm not a person, a producer personally, but if I was a producer, what would you, as we talk about your preparation, what are the things of all the things you gave me in my risk tools, tool belt for risk management, what do I really need to be paying attention to as a producer in Pacific Northwest? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, in, in, in what the forecast that I just put out there, um, uh, certainly if, you know, I wouldn't want to just go plant all my corn, soybeans and spring wheat, you know, in two weeks time and then get caught with a hard freeze and I got to go replant everything. I mean, meaning that's a simple thing that you can do. It doesn't mean don't plant anything when you're getting this good, but it means maybe you just kind of space it out that if you do have an issue, it's not the biggest issue out there. Crop insurance is going to continue to play a huge role in managing these risks going forward. Um, I, I speak in a lot of uh, crop insurance uh, meetings, and they're getting more and more uh, uh, they're getting more and more creative with what they can cover and how they cover things. And you know, a lot of farmers don't like spending large amounts of money on some of these more exotic uh, insurance products, but that's fine when it was the way it was, but I really believe as we go forward, you know, I think that's going to be a very, very important tool. And of course, I really believe that managing price risk, you know, I mean, if, you know, if I'm someone that um, needs physical wheat and I, and I believe anything Sean just said about a potential hard freeze here in mid late February or May, you know, I'd want to be doing things, whether it's locking in, extending my cash contracts, whether it's, protecting upside price risks on paper, which can certainly be done, you know, with the futures and options route. I mean, there's just a lot of things you can do that says, I'm going to take that risk off the table that if my crop's the one that gets the hard freeze and I, my production is nothing what I thought it was going to be, you know, um, uh, and, and, and those supplies are, are less, you know, it's just, that's the kind of thing you know, that I really, uh, and, and of course, if you're a farmer and says, wait a minute, I, I'm looking at a good crop right now. It really looks fantastic. And all of a sudden, you know, maybe I'm thinking it's down 30% of what I thought it was. Doing some of these other factors don't lock you into a cash contract that maybe you're uncomfortably cash sold on versus what your production now turns out to be from a weather shock of some of the things we mentioned. So, so those are just kind of the things that I certainly think that producers can be thinking about um, on, a, on a more regular basis um, to try to mitigate some of these risks. Anyone have any questions? I think everyone's probably absorbing. I think one thing, the other thing I was thinking of, Sean, is as you went back to the turn of this of the last century, so the 1900s, sorry, I keep this bad 
uh, 19th century and then the 19, like 30s, as we looked at like the drought, would it, would it behoove us to be a, 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 a student of history perhaps and go back and kind of see what the situation looked like to learn a little bit more about what what's ahead in some regard? Go back to, to look ahead. When you look at the dramatic volatility of the weather, the inflationary, I mean, it looks like, I think I want to just sleep through 2026 because that doesn't look like a lot of fun. It certainly isn't going to be a lot of fun um, if you're having big short crops because we know rarely does price ever compensate you for a really poor crop. Um, you know, you, you can have insurance and crop and all these things, but it's not going to be fun, but you can at least make the risks less bad if that's probably poor English, but I mean, you know, not as impactful. You, know, you can't control everything. Um, but at the same time, you know, you are going to get opportunities to sell at a better level that at least what you do produce, you're going to get more for it than, than if you oversold at the wrong time and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think studying history, that's what we have done our entire career is studied history, studied statistics, studied historical documents, studied um, correlations and cycles and, and what did happen, what did prices do, um, you know, and, and how did we handle it? It's what's very fortunate today is that we have this artificial intelligence that and this quantum computing that's just growing exponentially that I think can find solutions to some of these issues incredibly fast versus what we would have been able to have done, let's say in the 70s or in the 30s. So it doesn't mean there isn't a learning curve, but I think we can come up with solutions that 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 are going to be much faster in 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 duration and be able to give farmers quicker tools to mitigate some of these risks. Not 100%. So so the good news is we are in an environment where we actually, but I think if we're given the right price signals, can probably get get a way to figure out a way to mitigate some of this much much faster. Um, and that's the good news, although, you know, certainly it's not going to be an overnight sensation, but I think it can be, instead of being, um, you know, 10 or 15 years waiting, you know, maybe we can figure out in five or seven years, we can figure out a better mousetrap of what do we do if Sean's right that this weather volatility is going to stay like this, you know, we have to grow crops, we have to feed the world, we have to feed people, what can we do? You know, I'm not as smart as AI and quantum, you know, computing on a quantum level, but it, the way I'm reading those things they're going to make that those technology are going to do things that are just unimaginable. And that's fantastic news in something like this to reduce the humanitarian consequences. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? If you want to just jump on it, maybe it, it's one more thing you can't, you can't grab your phone right now. Does anyone have any questions? You unmute if you want. If you want to. Well, if, unless someone jumps in, Sean, thank you. That's a lot. I'm very glad we recorded this so that we can kind of go back and look at this. Um, thank you so much. And I appreciate everyone who's on this call today. We hope you found the webinar beneficial and in a convenient format to participate. Um, we'd also like to again, thank our sponsors for making pro the program possible and free to you today. Um, we invite you to take a part of any of our upcoming events. Again, in the chat, you'll find not only the survey, but the link to our website to find more. And uh, we just thank you all for being here. And thank you, especially Sean, for um, that vast amount of information that we'll probably be sorting through. So thank you so much. Um, thanks to everyone and just have a marvelous day. Thank you.